Okay, great. So uh, let's start the class. Uh, brief recap, we talk about games, motivations, different solution concepts, and a representation using normal form gift. Here, we want to uh, talk about another form of representing the games, which is perfect information, extensive form games, in general, like extensive form games. And we see that the relation between this one and the normal form games. And interestingly, then you can define some kind of equilibrium, which are actually a special kind of Nash equilibrium, which will be very useful for this type of uh, like representation. And then this is the way that also, if you see this one, some game like chess or others, you can actually represent them using this form of things. You can still represent them with normal form game as we discussed, because this is a special case of that. But there are some particular Nash equilibrium and min max uh, that we discussed that will be more uh, like uh, explicit here or more easy to describe in this format. Uh, good. So uh, let me go. So uh, let's consider this sharing game. There are, uh, say, there are two children. So I'm offering them two cookies, but only if they agree to how to share, like a parent wants to give them. So there are two children, like as I mentioned, one and two. Agent one choose one of the following options. Agent one gets two cookies and agent two gets zero cookies. So these are the choices that agent one decides about. Then, uh, or they each get one cookies or agent one gets zero cookies and agent two gets two cookies. So these are the moves by agent one or the child. Then agent two chooses to accept or reject a split. If he or she accepts, they each get their own cookies, according to the agreement. If not, neither one gets anything. Okay, so agent one, the child one, decide which one you should go there. The second one should accept, then we get it. Both get the thing that they, they agreed on. Otherwise, they get both uh, zero. OK, so uh, let's uh, represent this one with this essentially extensive form game, which is a tree shape thing. Uh, another interesting thing, I think we are talking here about the graphs. And uh, in general, uh, if you go to my introduction to algorithms, I'm talking a lot about graphs and trees and special, like the special properties of them. Uh, I think this may not covered in other courses that you took, but you can, they're all on YouTube. You can just go and essentially watch that. Good. Now, uh, let's represent uh, this uh, essentially. Uh, let's uh, represent this one as uh, like a tree. So this would be the first, uh, essentially the agent. Say so which agent is the one that the, the nodes of this tree would be the agents that they should do an action. And each age of them would be the action that they are taking. And it is essentially from top down. Uh, so uh, here, the first person, essentially, this is the first agent. Then the options that he or she has, 2, 0, 1, 1, and 0, 2. And then after that, this is the second person's move. And then if they, yes, for example, they agreed about 2, 0, they, uh, so here we say that the first agent gets 2, the other one gets 0. Otherwise, both gets 0. The same thing here, if they agree, it would be 1, 1, otherwise it would be 0, and so on. So this is a sharing game, and this is essentially the extensive form game that we represent as a tree.
Cool. Uh, This is okay. So uh, as we discuss this, uh, I mean sharing. Uh, so this uh, sharing game is actually we have represented as an extensive form game. Here, uh, this is a game in which the we make the temporal structure. It means that, I mean, these are essentially the timing issues. We make it explicit. And we don't assume that these agents act simultaneously because one after the other, it is like essentially chess or other games, Go and others. Uh, uh, as I mentioned, so extensive form game, as we discussed, can be actually converted to normal form game. So all previous results carries over to here. However, there are some additional results that depends on essentially this kind of temporal structure or timing that we are considering and the fact that this is not simultaneous. So in the perfect information game, and also the uh, like imperfect information game as well, the extensive form game would be a game tree. As we mentioned, the So uh, here the nodes essentially represent the agents that they should do the move. Edges are available actions or the move for that person. And at each terminal node edge, terminal node essentially means any leaf here. We will say, but it would be the utility for each agent. Good. Make sure and everything. So uh, this is, I mean, from the book. I mean, there are other things there, but I mean, this is the one, the book that we use part of it, essentially the Kevin Layton Brown and uh, Yav Shaham. These are like the authors of the paper, one of the main references for the book, for this class. Uh, so the notations are not necessarily best, but the one that they are using, I just mentioned that essentially that here they are considering H. So H would be that all non-terminal nodes. So terminal would be these guys. These guys would be non-terminal. D would be, uh, so here we will say that these the terminal nodes and H are these people. Now, if H is a non-terminal node, a row of H is the player to move at H. So essentially, you can consider some kind of the label of this node that we put it. A chi of H, all available actions at H. So these are the all possible set of edges that are coming out of it. So that is essentially, this one would be equal to, uh, sorry, that would be a row of H. A row of H would be one. This set of actions would be a chi of H. And finally, this, uh, this is a sigma of H and A would be the um, node produced by action A at node H. For example, here, if this is a, this is a node H, and then we take the action 2.0, then the result would be two in this case. Two would be the, uh, essentially the result of the action, uh, the result of the node and the action. So this is essentially said that who is the child of this vertex. 
this this particular if you are using this particular edge. So if uh, H is any node, it can be terminal or non-terminal. So H has history. So this is if this is H, use a different color here. So if you consider this H, uh, I mean, essentially the path from the root to this vertex, that would be the history of H. And here again, this one is unique. And all of these uh, people in the sub theory of this, it is, these are the descendants of H, all the nodes. I mean, uh, you can actually call each node also give them a label, but I mean, uh, if, and or we can consider essentially some kinds of um, canonical uh, numbering from the top guy would be one, and then from essentially left to right, you are giving the numbers. So these are some kinds of notations if you want to read the book. But I mean, but it, essentially the important thing is that these three things, the row of H is the person who is doing the move, Chi of H, all possible actions, and then more importantly, is this sigma uh, H A. Uh, that is the node produced by action A at node H. Mm, good. So let's talk about the pure strategies. Uh, so, uh, so pure strategy for agent I is a function that tells you on each node that this vertex essentially is present or row of that vertex is that agent. What is the action that that person takes? So that's essentially a way to make this game from this kind of extensive form game to a normal form game. We need to see what are the pure strategies that or the action was in shit there. As I mentioned, say we are assuming essentially a canonical order on the nodes that say, for example, this is the first node, then this is the second, this is the third, fourth, some kind of BFS essentially. Five this is the BFS number, six and so on. So, so here, uh, so when we talk about the nodes, these are the ordering of this node essentially. Now, uh, let's see what will happen here. Uh, here, so let's consider agent one. For agent one, so what are the nodes this edge that appeared just here? One node. So there is one node that uh, row of H is equal to one, which is this. Then in this case, I need to say what are the actions that he or she takes. Two, zero, one, one, and zero. Two. And as I mentioned, this is the canonical order that we are going. Now, so that's for one. Now, what, uh, what about for two? For two is more interesting. For two, uh, uh, we have, let me use again different color here. So for two, we have this one, this one, and this one. Now, uh, again, consider the order in the canonical order. And then for each of them, we need to say which strategy 
or which action at each node, we should say which action that person takes at that particular node. Because these nodes are different. Essentially. So here it can be, uh, uh, there are essentially eight possibilities because each of them have two possibilities. There are three of them would be two to three. So it would be yes. Sorry, what did happen? <laughs> yeah, so something. Uh, the people at Zoom, do you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so that is something happened with sharing with Zoom. Let me um, wait for them to respond. Don't know what it happened to Zoom. Mm. I may need to restart it. Mm. Do you still hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Your video yeah. is uh frozen though. Yeah, that is I think the problem <laughs> exactly the issue. I don't know what is the problem. Uh let me, I mean I need to probably close it and then open it again. Uh wait for the program to respond. Let me just close it. And Okay, so uh, good. Good. So uh, great. And you see everything now. Correct? Yes. Yes. Uh, great. Okay. Now, uh, here, uh, so we were talking about the pure strategy for agent uh, two here. And as I uh, mentioned, uh, here for agent two, you need to get all places that it is labeled two, and then all actions. For example, here, yes, 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 would be one pure strategy. And then you will say yes, yes, no, would be the second strategy, and there are eight of them. So these are the pure strategies that we have. So that's the first step, essentially, to make a normal form game. Because in normal form game, we need to say what are the pure strategies or actions of each of these players. Good. But still, we need to, I mean, say what is the matrix and what is the insight. Like you said, that what are the things that the people are considering? But uh, on top of that, we need to say what are the utilities on each cell of the matrix and how can we get it? Uh, so let me just clear out the right. Good. Here, as I mentioned, yeah, so every game would be. So uh, every game essentially corresponds to an equivalent normal form game. 
Uh, the first step is to get all the pure strategies that we discussed. And as I mentioned, so at every A place, every node that an agent appears, you need to know which move that person should take. And now uh, let's see this particular example. In this game, I mean, the agent one has four pure strategies. Why? Because agent one is here and here. So here it, he can take C and D, and here it can take G and H. Correct. So there are four cases that is possible. So, but this is some kind of redundancy is coming here. Why? You see, if this agent one takes A, then actually then agent one here gets G or H, they are redundant because I mean that person take A. We are not coming in this uh, this subtree even. So that might be not relevant. Of course, if it takes B and then it may be relevant. And similarly here, the agent two has, again, four strategies. It has essentially, it's two he's here and here. And each of them has two strategies and then essentially we are uh, taking two pure strategies. Uh, good. Uh, good. So uh, then the question is that, okay, we have done that for, for example, for this particular case, I mean, we have written all the pure strategies of each of these agents. As I mentioned, four for agent one and four, this is agent one, I believe. So for agent one, essentially, this is for agent one and this is for agent two. And these are the all four strategies that we discussed. Now the issue that how can we find the utilities? Okay, so uh, this is the interesting part. So uh, let's, uh, you want to say what is the, for example, in this case, what would be the, uh, like, utilities when you reach to the leaf, or what is the utility actually you want to put it in this cell of the main. So the for first agent, we say A and G. So, okay, so here we are selecting A and G. This is the pure strategy that we have. Then let's do the same thing for, the second agent as well. Uh, of course, what are the second agents we are considering here? It is C and F. C here and F is here. Good. Always there would be a unique path from the root to one of the ter essentially terminals or the leaf. So that uh, it seems a bit magic, but it's not a magic. It is somehow by definition, because you know that at each at each of these things from the root, each one has a label, and you know that you are taking one of them essentially. So here, for example, you take one essentially. When you come here, then then you know that okay, this other part is essentially gone. But this guy again, when you come to two, then you know that two also select one of these children. So then you will go to one of them. So the other one is not there. Then you will continue at the end, you will reach to one leaf. And that leaf, the utility is the utility that we are writing. So always for each of these uh, strategies, like if you take this strategy versus this strategy, always there is a unique path that goes from the root to a terminal. That terminal, what is the utility? That's the utility that we write in the norm. So that's the way that essentially we can uh, generate this one. However, uh, note that uh, here there are some redundancy, as I mentioned. In uh, this representation, in this tree form, 
we had essentially four, uh, five outcomes for the game. <laughs> These are essentially all the terminals that we had. Correct? But here in this normal form game, we have 16. And if you see, for example, three eights, So this 3-8 happens a lot essentially here. It was just only one time here, but this one is rather replicated essentially to five other, four other places, four places essentially. And generally, this is the thing that I have mentioned before. So uh, essentially normal form game is a very powerful approach to represent any game, even when we have a temporal thing. Uh, like essentially some kind of timing or non-simultaneous, so still you can represent it. The only issue is that then the size of the normal form game, will, the normal form matrix may essentially blow up exponentially. We have seen the same thing. If you remember in the Brasses paradox, we had the same thing as well. We said that there are 1,000 drivers and each of them can take two things. If you want to represent it as a, essentially matrix in an explicit form, of course, you can do that, but then the size of this matrix was two to the 1,000. So uh, in some sense, normal form game is very powerful. Uh, this is a very good way essentially to consider and define the equilibrium concepts there. But sometimes we may have a more implicit essentially, or more, uh, you know, a concise form which represent the game in a better, like in a better form. And this is the extensive form essentially is one of them. Good. So let me. <laughs> so uh, let's talk about Nash equilibrium. Now we know that why this kind of reduction essentially to, or changing the form reduction between mm, these two, like normal form and extensive form is important because then we can just use the Nash's theorem that we had it before. Every perfect information game in like in extensive form has a pure strategy Nash equilibrium. So uh, first we know that there is a Nash equilibrium. And then I want to say that it would be a pure one. And this theorem, I think, ha has attributed to Vermelo in 1930. There are some other controversy about that. And uh, this is important. I mean, just see essentially the year it is 1930. So this was. Uh, this is essentially the discussion between AI and CS. And I remember this was actually interesting. When uh, MIT computer science, uh, like back when I joined MIT in 2001, at that time, there was two labs there. There was the AI lab and the computer science lab. And then they both, they were in the one building. Then they want to move to this new one, which is called a CSAIL now, if you search. Uh, then there was the issue that, I mean, whether, so we said, okay, computer science, AI is part of computer science. But the AI people didn't agree with that. They said, oh no, AI was there before computer science. No, if they, I mean, the current lab is actually, it is called CSAIL. C sale, they will create it. But this is why, because they couldn't agree with it, it should be, because okay, computer science, I mean, I think at that time, maybe computer science was in a higher hype. But I said, no, uh, this AI was before computer science. So you cannot remove the name and put it in, we could, we could just say CSL essentially, but they, the people didn't agree and say it should be CSAI. And that is actually interesting. You would see this thing is not just there; it is everywhere. You see, this is this some of these things that essentially some of these discussions were like 1913, which is much before the computer science age even. Computer science, I mean, maybe started like around some of the early paper 1950, 1960, or something like this. And you would see also the same thing here. You see, they are talking about computing at some point. Now they are talking about AI. So you don't say computer science 
per se, you will say AI essentially. So everything is due to AI. And like that is somehow uh, subsuming computer science. So this kind of uh, essentially like contention or essentially competition between CS and AI has been there for a long time. That's actually a interesting things to know. And it's not clear that one can subsume the others. <laughs> Anyhow, so if one, do we say it is a pure strategy? So the idea is that general, I mean, we will talk about it and we will prove it later. And actually we mentioned how we can get even one Nash equilibrium, which is pure, and we'll talk about it. But somehow the idea is that Agents essentially here, they are making the move one after the other. They will see the move of the other person. <clears throat> so here, because they are, like we are using randomness, for example, in the matching pennies or other games, because you cannot see what is the action the other person is doing. But here we are seeing the action of other person. So essentially there is no need to do the randomness or this kind of mixed strategies to get the Nash equilibrium. So we knew that there is a Nash equilibrium, but here said that there is a pure one. And here you can actually see that. So in this game, for example, there are uh, a three pure uh, strategy Nash equilibrium. Uh, uh, we will talk more about it, but that was just, this one so far is just intuition. So this one is a Nash equilibrium, Why? Right? So this is AG versus CF. So if this one wants to do AG, so for this is the first player, this is the second player. So the second player cannot get anything better because I mean it is at most eight he can get. It is in the weak, in, it is in the weak sense, not the strong sense, but still the national. And if this person wants to take CF, then the first person also cannot get anything better because three is the maximum that can get in it. You can say the same thing about this other choices as that. On the other. But there are pure, three pure Nash equilibrium. Uh, uh, so here, the, the, as I mentioned, so uh, we know that this kind of uh, essentially normal extensive form game, they can have a Nash equilibrium. But this concept of Nash equilibrium, uh, itself, it might be just too weak. Like essentially we can get a better type of equilibrium in this game that we are talking about. Or in some sense, these are special cases of Nash equilibrium that we can uh, essentially define. Uh, so uh, here, uh, as I mentioned, essentially this game, for example, that we talk has three essentially pure Nash equilibrium. But uh, here, I mean, as you will see that this one is, uh, so, uh, and uh, this is uh, like, uh, for example, I mean, this is one of these strategies that we have. And this is a game essentially, which is a Nash equilibrium case, essentially. We talk about, uh, uh, so let's essentially, so this is the BH and C. So, uh, and this is uh, like uh, one of this kind of Nash equilibrium that can be represented here. So in, in some sense here, we can have several Nash equilibriums. Uh, and, like, and, and, but we can have uh, something like pure and more structures that we want to talk more about. But... 
And what is the one that specific thing that we want to talk about it? It is. Um, So this is the one that we are actually, these are some kinds of spatial pure Nash equilibrium that we want to talk about it. And these games are sub game perfect equilibrium. So let's define a sub game of a graph. So see you are given essentially game G that is represented as a tree. A sub game at a, so sub game essentially means a sub tree. So you consider a node H here, or like a node H here, and then you will consider the whole subtree under it. That it is called, so this is the whole game, and this is a sub game. So this is the whole game, this, and this one is a sub game. Now, so among all possible this kind of uh, Nash equilibrium, we try to get one uh, which has a special properties. And what are these special? So a subgame perfect equilibrium, or we just say in abbreviation SP, is a strategy profile S such that for every subgame G prime of G, the restriction of S to G prime is a Nash equilibrium of G prime. So what's the meaning of, what's the meaning of restriction? So it means that, I mean, uh, uh, what was the pure strategy? So the pure strategy for each person was that you are taking all the nodes that this person appeared and for each of them, you are making some moves. But, <laughs> now, you can define the restriction of that to any subtrees because in any subtrees say that, okay, what are, so uh, for example, here, uh, I want to say uh, like this agent one appears here, this agent one appears here. So when you restrict it here, so it, it may have several moves here. I don't know, this move, this move, this move. And here it may have this move, this move. So when you essentially restrict it to this subtree or sub game, you just forget everything about it. You only consider the moves inside this subtree. So this is this is the meaning of a restriction of a pure strategy essentially to this sub game. So just forget about everything else, every other node which is not inside this tree, just forget about it. Those that remain in this subtree, for them, just take it actions according to original pure strategy. And what is the property? I want to have a stronger thing. I want to say that the, like the pure strategy that I find on in each of these ones is also a Nash equilibrium. So not only on the uh, essentially. Uh, not only, uh, of course, because G itself is a sub game of G, which is rooted at itself. Every SP is also a Nash equilibrium for the whole game. But you want to have this extra thing for every sub game as well. Okay. And, yeah. For every proper sub game? Uh, for every proper, and proper essentially means the one that we are defined. So for every, the sub game is the one that we are defining. Consider any node and all descendants of that or the subtree rooted at that. Uh, good. And if you see that, for example, in the previous case that we have mentioned, some of these uh, three strategies, three Nash equilibrium, some of them were not actually sub-game perfect equilibrium. And you could see why they are, there were some of them were not equilibrium. So uh, here, uh, one interesting thing is that every perfect information extensive form game has at least one SP. And we show actually how can we obtain it. This is essentially uh, proved by induction on the height of the game tree. 
uh, and we will talk about it. This is exactly the part that we are now essentially alluding to the concept of min max, and then this is kind kind of game theory, etc. But this is comes essentially out of the this kind of. So we first we consider this extensive form game. So okay, there are lots of Nash equilibrium. Even there are pure ones, but there are lots of pure ones. Now let's get one which is actually has extra property. What is the extra property is that if you uh, essentially restrict this uh, essentially Nash equilibrium to any sub tree, then uh, or any sub game, it is still a Nash equilibrium. Uh, good. And uh, now let's see. I mean, uh, let me just. So uh, let's see how can we do it essentially. First, I'm giving by example, and then we are writing actually a program to obtain this. And uh, by the way, I, uh, here we are proving that each game has one SP. And as I mentioned, SP is a special case of pure Nash equilibrium. So the, the theorem that we mentioned originally that every uh, extensive form game has a pure Nash equilibrium will be proved the way that we are proving. But let's see what will happen essentially here by some examples before going to the actual formalism to a program. So here we had a three Nash equilibrium. If you remember in the previous game, there was this three of them. But uh, consider uh, this sub game. So consider, for example, so this is a sub game, correct? This is a node one and all of its children. So uh, if the if the node is terminal, you don't do anything. In that case, <laughs> I mean, you have only utility. It means that without any action, you have the utility. So good. So if if I'm here, it means that. This is this in sub game is a trivial game. He said that I will give you one, the other person I will get the first person get one, the second person gets zero, and there is no need to do any move. But uh, let's come essentially to the first this guy. So for agent one here, so here agent two does not do any move. So everything, the whole game just depends on agent one. So for agent two, I mean, doesn't have any moves, cannot do. If you don't have a choice, I mean, sometime in life actually is good because you are just forced to take the thing that is there for you. You don't need to invest a lot and possibly regret about. Here, this is the case for agent two. But for agent one, G strictly dominates H. Why? Because, uh, I mean, here, if you take, so this is uh, for agent one, if he takes two, he be, he or she gets two. And if he or she takes H, then gets one here. Yes? Not yet. Okay. We will talk about it, but not yet. So here, this is essentially GH, and this is two and one that we are talking about it. It means that uh, here, this case, I mean, essentially one takes 210 as the best move here. Because H cannot be part of a Nash equilibrium. There might be some case that, I mean, they are equal and they can't take any of them. But in this case, G strictly dominates this one. So it means that, and two, I mean, there is no move for it. So then we just get 10 essentially. So here, this is essentially the one that for this agent essentially And here, this is important. So among these three Nash equilibrium that we discussed, actually this way, when we talk about perfect Nash equilibrium, then AH and these two cannot be Nash, I mean, essentially SP. They can be Nash equilibrium, they can be pure Nash equilibrium, but they are not SP. Why? Because they are taking at one, they are for one, they are taking H and which is a stupid move essentially. So here, there is only one subgame perfect equilibrium, which is AG and CF. So among three of them, only one of them is essentially the good one in some sense.
Okay, let's see how can we do this backward induction and actually find in this equation. Uh, good. So we are doing backward induction. It means that we are going essentially from uh, bottom to top. So we go from the below essentially to the top, from bottom. To top. So you are starting at each node essentially here. Note that still we want to find a pure Nash. And we want, uh, sorry, we want to find essentially uh, like this kind of strategy profile for each of them. So at each node, I need to say what should be your strategy. That was the definition of a pure strategy for each. At each node, I need to say what are the modes. So, uh, So we are essentially considered the bottom mass nodes, which are the terminals. And then we will come up. So uh, let's start here for it, uh, as we discuss. So uh, here between these guys, I mean, here, this is the national equilibrium would be one zero and this one. Then there is no move. Here. here, as we discussed, the, for one, essentially, it would be this action that it gets because that dominates the other one. So when this uh, action is chosen, we are considering the corresponding utilities for both agents and we bring it up. So if we reach this subtree, essentially, the best that agent one gets can get it would be two one. Or this is a Nash equilibrium for this assumption. Good. The same thing here. This is three eight and two eight. So here, this is for two. He can get actually here, he or she will choose this one, and then three eight will come there. So the, the essentially the utilities corresponding to the leaf will come up. Now, uh, what about here? So here, then the same essentially things. So now we have some kind of equilibrium here. This is the equilibrium here. Now this is the two to essentially choose that. Which of them would be the one that he or she will choose it? So here we have 210 versus 55. Five. In this case, the best thing for two would be to take this one. So in that case, 210 comes up. 38 is here. Now it is agent one. Agent one, it needs to decide which one it should take. And here, if the agent one is the one that takes it, essentially between, a, uh, between three and two, she, he or she will choose this one. And the 3 8 comes essentially. So uh, essentially, we are starting from bottom up at any time among all things. And we are assuming this is some kind of dynamic program you can think about it. You compute it all for all uh, when you come for a node. Uh, H here, we are assuming that all the nodes here have been computed. Now, for this agent, for this H, you will see what is the row of H. For row of H, we see that which one of these has the highest essentially payoff. That one, the one that will be selected, and the corresponding payoff, it will come up. And this can be defined actually if there are more than two players, three players. So to find, again, the subgame perfect equilibrium, we can use a backward induction. Identify the Nash equilibrium in bottom mass nodes, like essentially in a dynamic programming fashion. Assuming that if we reach there would be the Nash equilibrium, we will see uh, then among all the children, we are selecting the one that is the best for that row of that particular node, and the corresponding utility actually comes up. So this is essentially, if you want to write the program, would be this. This is the backward induction. So if H belongs to the Z, means the terminal, essentially. 
So if this is a terminal, then just return the utility of H. Otherwise, the best V is defined like minus infinity, essentially, for these things. The vector of... Uh, uh, so uh, what is the best V? The best V is the one that essentially takes the uh, best utility for rho of H. So if you say that for all actions belongs to uh, actions that rho of H can take it, Compute the backward induction inductively. As I mentioned, you can consider this dynamic programming that we are filling a table and is already compute. It can it is called memos dynamic programming essentially. We are talking about this introduction to algorithms if you want. So this for me, we are uh, this is the backward induction that we are doing for this one, and we compute it. So if uh, uh, v of uh, Rho of H is better than best of Rho of H. Note that uh, what do we return? Best V essentially is a vector. This is a utility function. This is the best V essentially. So this is the whole utility that we are returning because that's the one that we are deciding. Each of them returns the best utility. So among if a, a V of Rho of H is greater than the best V, so if this particular node the utility that this agent gets is more than the, the, the best one so far, just replace best V with this one, essentially. And best V, again, is essentially is the uh, variable uh, or temporary variable, uh, variables that say who is the best utility so far. Who is, uh, who uh, like, uh, which node, is, uh, like, what is the best utility uh, for all people Like what is the utility for all people, which is the best for the current node? That's the meaning of best. And then you will return the best. Very, very simple. So essentially some kinds of, uh, I mean, as I mentioned, some kinds of uh, traversal search in this tree. Good. So... Um, Let's see this particular case, essentially. Uh, the centipede game. What is the centipede game? This is the particular extensive form game that exists. So here, the player one essentially is doing the first move. Yeah. So player one makes the first move. Then each player can go either left or right. And they are alternating, essentially. So the first one is gets L or R. Then it is 1, 0. Then it goes to 2. Then it can do L and R. And these are the utilities. So they alternate here. The utilities would be 1, 0. They, uh, the utilities also some kind of alternates, not completely. Not complete loss for the other person, but there's some kind of. I put what the things the utilities is that I mean, say in this case, uh, the number of uh, pieces of chocolate that each person gets it. I mean, say if you have diabetes or something, maybe say you don't want to take chocolate, then it is the reverse of that will be there. The carrots, some things that you like, or some money essentially. Everyone wants money, two dollars essentially. So the chocolate, you may want to make it more healthy, essentially, I don't know. It's dollar, carrot, etc. Good. Now, uh, let's see what would be the SPE here. So SPE just come here in the this um, latest one here. So here, uh, for this node, one. I mean, to, for this node to compute it, you need to come to this node. But we, we need to compute this one. Then for this one, you need to compute this one, compute this one, compute this one. So we need to compute first this, for this guy. So for this guy, we have, like one, it has L and R. What is the best thing for one would be this one to take this action. So for three is coming. Then here, this is two, can get L and R. So it is uh, two, four versus four, three. So here, two, four comes up because four is better for us. Then for this one, one is two, four, and three ones. 
So in this case, essentially, it's better to get this one. So it's real one. And so on and so forth. So at the end of the things, we get one zero. Good. So we are computing this kind of uh, uh, SP, essentially, subgame perfect equilibria. And it becomes one zero. Note that, I mean, all of this, when we talk about this solution concept, we want to make it somehow into the practical sense. That's the whole idea that we are defining different concepts. I say, okay, in this scenario, that makes sense. In this scenario, it makes sense. That's the whole idea. The idea here is that the equilibrium here would be one zero. So, uh, So here in this centipede case, the only uh, the SP is uh, the one that for each agent, and, and the, again, this is the whole, uh, when we talk about this, we need to talk about the whole graph. For each agent, if it rises to that agent, that person should take left because all of them are left. But this is intuitively or practically is not appealing. Why? Because if the people, I mean, we can play actually this game, I think don't have that much time <laughs> today, but if you play this game, it would be stupid to, at the beginning of the game, you just go one zero, and they say, this is a common knowledge, we are by the definition of common knowledge. We had this thing that, I mean, why do you want to just end the game here? Just go a little bit down? Yes, you may not get essentially, uh, the other person may not get, uh, may get essentially more, for example, in this case, but you will get two versus one, essentially. So come down, essentially. Not at the beginning, you just go left. And uh, as I mean, in the lab experiments, I mean, these are the results that they have, people have done it, essentially. Uh, the subject is, is essentially these people are continuing choosing right until, until near the end of the game that they try to be very strategic. You may get $1 more, essentially. But not at the beginning. So in some sense, there is some kind of collaboration is going on. So how could we remove collaboration from a game? Go to zero sum game, become completely competitive game. So if we make it constant sum, as we discussed, zero sum and constant sum are the same. In this case, I mean, and in this case, the utility of the second person would be just uh, uh, the utility of the second person would be just five minus the utility of the first person. In this case, actually, you can just compute the same thing. You can compute it. So then you will say here, you start here, five, zero, it would be like this. Then here between one, four and this one, the actual, the best move would be one, four here. Then one here and here and here. And so that's essentially the equilibrium SP in this case. And this is a constant sum game or Pure competitive game because the loss of the other person would be your win. That we talk about it, and there is that in this game actually we can find Nash equilibrium using a linear program. So uh, previous time that we discussed that. Yeah, I think I wanted to do this game, but we don't have that much time here. So in this case, actually. That, I mean, there are some other things that the people have done at the lab. In this case, actually, the Nash equilibrium worked very well. And because it's a pure competitive game. And this is nothing different from chess, I don't know, Otello or Reversi or Go or lots of other games that we are doing because these are pure competitive. Your loss would be the win of the other person and uh, your win would be the loss of the other. In these games, actually, the 
concept of uh, SP worked very well. And that's exactly the uh, this um, So this is the essentially the last slide. This exactly comes to the concept of minimax. So in the minimax, essentially, as we discussed, uh, according to uh, minimax theorem, at each node, agent one uh, minimax value would be equal to agent one max min value equal to agent one SP utility. So all of this, if we have this kind of constant sum games, so SP minimax and uh, max mean all of them essentially become the same concept. All of them would be pure. And that's exactly the one that you need to compute essentially in these games like chess, reversi, and others. So the procedure here, essentially this is the same backward induction that we had it before. Just the fact here is that, uh, I mean, we can simplify this one. So here we say that for any H, uh, for any, um, essentially H, uh, we are assuming that here the utility of the second person is C minus utility of the first person. So always we talk about the first agent, but of course we can talk about the second agent as well because you can compute that. But here for the first agent, so if uh, H is belong to Z, just returns essentially U1 of H, how much you get it for the first person. Otherwise, if this one, if rho of H is one, then in this time you maximize you will maximize over all actions that you want, the one that is the best for you among your children. What about if it is not the case, if it is the second, and this is a two-player zero sum game. If it is not the case, then you need to compute essentially what about the mean guy? Why the mean? Because we are assuming because of the max mean in the equilibrium, we know that the second guy try to minimize for me because my minimization would be his or her maximum. So that's essentially the game that you can do it. And this is the one that we computed. And in this case, uh, also, for example, for agent one here, this three will, would be the value of this game. So say that if the top guy is one, what is the value of the game for the root would be three. The, because the other person would be the, that constant sum in here, five minus two, essentially. So the value of the game, that's the same value that we obtain using linear programming, actually can computed here essentially and that would be the one that we have it so here instead of linear programming which generally is a, i mean we discussed the running time of utility linear programming is actually not that great it is practical but not that great here we have a much essentially faster algorithm that finds a pure one for us in a very fast way and then still it seems very good but still if the size of this tree is large you may need to do more other things we will talk about some other uh, Things like alpha, beta pruning and others that you can do it and makes this one essentially in a better, even more efficient way. So I stop uh, here.